folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Radam Egberto. Well, your host, thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today. Bridge MCP, welcome aboard. Tom C, welcome aboard. Peggy Lopez, welcome aboard. Uh, Squido, how are you doing, Squido? Bridge MCP, Yvette Avery Herod says, afternoon to all. Michael Rudnan says, I just got home. Well, it's good we have a... a, a an interview to start out with, but yes, tomorrow is Senor Tom C. Tomorrow is Ask Egberto Anything. We'll talk about it after the interview. Let's go ahead and get the interview started, and then we'll go ahead and start uh, doing stuff thereafter. So let's get that interview started, and then immediately after, we'll get on. Welcome to another edition of Politics Done Right. Once again, we are here with our series with Dr. Andy Schmuckler. Dr. Andy Schmuckler is a prize-winning author, former Democratic candidate for Congress in Virginia, very red Shenandoah's Valley. Virginia's very red Shenandoah Valley, former talk show host, uh, summa cum laude graduate of Harvard University, PhD awarded with distinction in a program specifically created to accommodate his original theory explaining how civilization has developed and a frequent columnist in newspapers around the United States. Once again, Dr. Schmuckler, welcome to Politics and Right. Good to see you, Egberto. Well, look, uh, we've had so far two very inciting conversations, uh, of which I think two have aired. Oh, well, actually, I think it's three, and I think two have aired already. Yeah, this and, is our fourth. Yes, this is our fourth conversation. And I must say that I'm enjoying it. I always, uh, you're, you're one who came out with the website, A Better Human Story. And I think uh, you, you share a point of view that is important for us to talk about. So where do you want to take us today, Dr. Schmuckler? Well, I want to convey in the course of this conversation to uh, our listeners that there is visible in the world a couple of coherent forces that in the course of this conversation, I hope I can sort of uh, demonstrate or elucidate, sketch out um, two forces, one of which works toward wholeness, that's thunder. That's that's God's punctuation on this. Don't sentence. get shocked now. Yeah, I could lose power. Where I live, you know, a thunderstorm is uh, sort of like a precursor to uh, losing power. power. <laughs> but power in the, you know, in only the electricity sense. Okay. Uh, <laughs> which I don't know what we do then. But one of those forces I've been focused on acts very much like evil has been conceived in, in the Western religious tradition. But it's a secular approach to looking at it. It's not about anything supernatural. But I say that we can actually see that in the, the human world, since we embarked on civilization, there are these two forces that compete with each other over which is going to shape the human world and the human future. And it looked very much like good battling evil. And uh, being in America in these times has led me to perceive how that works. Now, um, you, you also say that, uh, I mean, you said in your piece, something that might reasonably be called the battle between good and evil can be seen at the heart of the human drama. Is this the heart of the human drama? Are we talking about the United States only, or is this something that you're seeing in the entire world? I think that, I mean, we've talked before about why going on the path of civilization inevitably unleashes a force of brokenness. So I would say it's not just the United States, though we're an important country in terms of the future of humankind. It's been a part of the human dramas from the beginning, from the beginning, not necessarily of... Uh, uh, of, of our species, but of the story of civilization as it has unfolded. So I say that any species on any planet that embarks on that path is going to have to 
uh, have at that at the center of their drama the battle of between good and evil. Last time we talked about the the central challenge that would face any such creature, which is, are we going to be able to order our civilization well enough and soon enough to uh, to prevent our self destroying ourselves? That's true here on Earth, and I think it would inevitably, according to the uh, the dynamics that I'm trying to present, it would be true of any species that has embarked on that path. I, I think you need to explain something, Doctor, um, because you, you make an interesting statement that sometimes sounds counterintuitive, right? You said our path towards civilization can also increase our brokenness. Why? Well, it, it, the, the, bef before a, a, any creature embarks on that path, the evolution of life creates a kind of order. And I, I've used this line before in our conversations, how the lion and the zebra and the grass, I mean, that's just a shorthand to talk about the, the nature of the ecological order that evolution continually, not to personify it, but it, by, by, the by the consistent choice of what can survive into the future uh, versus what can't, it creates that kind of an order. But the step into civilization, and I define civilization as, or the path to civilization is when a, a creature extricates itself from the niche in which it evolved biologically by inventing its own way of life. I mean, we were, uh, before 10 or 12,000 years ago, we were still living like primate bands and still more or less contained in that order in which we evolved. But as soon as we start inventing our own way of life and developing um, ways of getting our subsistence out of nature, not out of what nature spontaneously provides, like but out farming of- Farming and, and, and gaming, yeah. Farming yes. and, you know, yeah. Yeah, all that stuff, which is, you know, like, like that wasn't what, what the, you know, wasn't the niche in which we evolved biologically. Uh, human societies start to grow in terms of numbers, in terms of territory, in terms of, of the range of choices that are available to it. But I don't, I don't want to go over that ground too much because we've done it, but it is a fundamental part of this picture that we step into anarchy. Anarchy means a war of all against all. The war of all against all means that a non-random selection from among the vast human possibilities, human cultural possibilities, will be it will prevail in that battle. Others will be destroyed or absorbed uh, as, as as colonial properties or whatever. So, the selective process that is introducing a force of brokenness that had not existed before. I mean, you could have brokenness in the, in, in the, in the natural world before that because North America and South America join together as the continental pl plates come together. That creates ca chaos. There, there are ways in which uh, invasive species get introduced to islands in the Pacific or whatever, or a, an asteroid might come screaming out of the uh, uh, out of the cosmos and slam into the planet. So the things that life couldn't control can create brokenness. But what we introduced was a new kind of brokenness out of the living system itself because we took that unprecedented step. And that force of brokenness ramifies through the ages. I mean, we talked about this last time out, if I recall, that, that people get broken. I mean, the trauma of living in a war of all against all is no small thing. Let's, yes, sir. Let's bring this into today's reality, okay? Uh, let's bring that to the angst that we're having in America right now, where we have we seem to have a party that is simply living on on fallacies we have another party that seems impotent to actually 
uh, effect or convince or do what's necessary to bring that order that one would expect in a civilization. Let's bring down your that we are a broken society into what you're speaking about. And then let's start talking solutions. So let's go ahead and start about how do you map that brokenness and, and the reality of that occurring into today's reality? Well, if it hadn't been, I mean, I've, I've wrestled with the issue of evil, you know, since the 70s. You know, and I, I could describe that, the various stages I went through trying to understand this. Um, but if I, if America had just gone on more or less the way I, the society had that I grew up in, uh, you know, born in 46 and so the decades after that. Explain what that society is you're talking about, because I want people to get the real picture. What, if America had stayed in the society we had in 46, what did that society look like? Well, it, it had its problems for sure, but... In, in terms of the, the, what I was about to say, which is about uh, what the Republican Party has become. You know, my first, the first president I ever really had a chance to study in action was uh, President Eisenhower, 50, 1950, or January 53 to January 61. I mean, there was a decent man. I don't necessarily agree with everything he did, but he, I, I've read biographies of him, and y you can say, well, maybe he, he misjudged this, what he did in Guatemala, or what he did in a, Iran. Um, you know, we were engaged in a Cold War. There are a lot of difficult decisions to make in the war of all against all. But he was a decent man who ran a decent presidency. And I would say even up through the first Bush presidency, uh, 89 to 93. It's a normal American party. And, you know, most, most individuals, if you study them in history, most political parties, even most nations, are mixtures of constructive and destructive forces at work. Uh, most people you know, you know, you can admire some aspects of what they do, but then there are the broken aspects of what they do. I'm thinking of like writing something about this guy, Rusty Bowers from, uh, you know, that we saw on TV uh, in, in the hearings. And, and he's, I, I mean, it's just, it boggles my mind that he can, on the one hand, quite sincerely talk about the sacred oath that he took, but he can say he can support the guy again if he is the Republican nominee, I mean, there's something broken there. I mean, how can you consider your oath sacred and binding? I can't do that. That's against the very core of my being, he says. And I don't think he's lying. I think he's sincere. And yet he could support again a guy that he experienced as attacking the constitutional order that he took a sacred oath to defend. There's something, there's something fishy going on there. I'm not saying dishonest. I'm saying broken. Why won't you say dishonest? Why wouldn't I? Yeah. Well, it is dishonest. Well, I don't think he's being insincere when he talks yes, uh, yesterday, and we're talking here the day after right, his yes. hearing. Um, I don't know when this goes public, but when he teared up, uh, at least that's what it looked like to me when he was talking about doing what he thinks you know, that, that, that the Constitution is divinely inspired. Right. I, I mean, he, he sure believed that. And, and what, I mean, to put it bluntly, he prevented a, the, the Arizona House, if I re recall, yeah. from coming into session to try to destroy the election in Arizona. So, so I give him full credit for having acted with integrity in that moment. I will not do that. I voted for you. I support supported you, but I will not disobey the law for you or violate the Constitution. And then he, you know, if you want to protect the Constitution, you've got to prevent that guy 
Right, because otherwise he's uh, if he if uh, those who are saying they believe Trump did the wrong thing, but if he's the nominee, they'll support him. In effect, they will be complicit in the destruction of the the Constitution. They they can't have it both ways. Well, they do have it both ways, and that's a sign of brokenness. As right. I, you know, I I conceive of um, I mean brokenness. It, I define evil, and, and again, this is not a supernatural thing. A coherent force that consistently spreads a pattern of brokenness. Mm -hmm. And today's Republican Party fits that pretty completely, not a hundred percent, but really astonishingly completely. I, 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 I've said for a good while, and I, I believe of myself that I have intellectual integrity, you know. Yeah, I, uh, I, I wrote something about my father that if you could establish that he was wrong and you were right, he would give up his position for yours. And, and I've admired that and tried to follow it. My honest opinion is this Republican Party is astonishingly consistent in spreading a pattern of brokenness. And that alerted me. I mean, when I saw how the power of greed and racism and lack of integrity and dishonesty, and you can make, these are all an injustice. These are all forms of brokenness as I see it. And I came to see that, that they're really different forms of the same thing. And I came up with the concept of patterns of brokenness. And then I saw how I would ask myself, well, how did, how did it come to be that the Republican Party would consistently block necessary action on climate change? And I would look at the causes of that. And then I'd look at the effects of that. How did it come to be that these people would have a thirst for power such that they would do whatever, whatever getting more power required. And I, you know, I've been analyzing how, how civilized systems work for, you know, well, I guess I would go back to 1965. Um, and then the, the, the idea that came to me in 1970 that changed the course of my life, that we've been talking about the anarchy, the selection for power, the spirit of the gangster, the, the, the course of social evolution being, of the, being determined by giving the spirit of the gangster a disparate, that whole thing. Let's stop right there. Okay. Because isn't, you just, anytime you use that word, the spirit of the gangster, isn't that what we're seeing in the Republican Party. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, people have talked for some years now about Donald Trump and it's the Trump party right now. But even if Trump died tonight, it would still be the party of, of a, a, a fascist force. It would still be the MAGA party, yeah. It, it would still be a party that has a great deal in common with, with Putin and- Mussolini. Mussolini <clears throat> and-, and uh, the, the, the fascism that, that I see as a modern version of the cruel tyrannies that came up with civilization wherever civilization became fully blown uh, in the ancient world, whether it was the, 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 the pharaohs with their slaves to build their pyramids or the, the emperors of, of Mesopotamia, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, you know... It, you enumerated in using the Republican Party as uh, you know as our sort of discussion point today. In 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 your uh, lead up to this show today, you really enumerated a lot of things that that you know how can Republicans stand for these things? You could say interest in how readily greed and bigotry and lack of integrity, etc., form alliances. <clears throat> and you brought up that the Republican Party is a representation of fans. That fans racial hostilities transfer wealth and power from the average citizen to the mightiest fans the flames of racial hatred chooses to prioritize uh, making their rival fail over helping the nation to succeed as a whole, thereby shows a desire for more power. I mean, all these characteristics of the Republican Party, could this really, though, exist in a vacuum or is that 
a part of more a part of this brokenness societal brokenness that you speak about well i the a, an impetus of brokenness was injected into the human system thousands of years ago and what i want to convey in terms of the battle between good and evil mm -hmm. is that if you look at how that works how that impetus you know like uh, you know like the, the the idea of an impetus uh, uh, there's an earthquake um off the coast of japan or maybe off the you know the, the thousands of years ago off the coast of washington state or in oregon and the shock of that moves a whole wall of water uh, even across the planet I and mean, we, we've seen that a couple times uh, 2004 the one that uh, indonesia and, and thailand oh, yeah. and and then the one in japan that did in that nuclear that that's what it looks like if you look at how do things get transmitted i mean we don't get this white supremacy movement we don't get this neo-nazi bunch of militias we don't get this corporate greed uh, out of nowhere there there's a history behind them and it's you know a line that i keep on using is the ugliness we see in human history is not human nature writ large human nature has gotten twisted and warped by the spirit of the gangster having a disproportionate say by the traumatization of people by the workings of power in a system in which there is no order that makes sure that the lion and the zebra and the grass equivalent uh, uh, are, are going to prevail in the system we have a system in that's at work in in the human world that could result in self-destruction you know which is not the way it is in the serengeti plain between the lion and the zebra and the grass they're not going to destroy that system we might because we're in a different kind of system because the impetus of brokenness is moving and as it moves it changes forms so that you get war war produces uh, selection for societies that are based on maximizing power which means that the that the the people who win those wars will be people who have turned their the 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 mass of humanity into slaves and cannon fire fodder it, we will have traumatized people who will feel driven to get to be the strongest one because they've experienced the trauma that weakness can bring there's all these different ways that you can see brokenness moving through the system changing forms and that's why i say if you look at all these forms of brokenness that have joined forces on in conservative America now, and look at how they developed out of the slave power, out of corporate, uh, the, the corporate system that emerged after the Civil War in the North. If you look at how all of those forces have been moving, you see, oh my gosh, you can see a force behind all of that moving a pattern of brokenness. And you can see the force. Another phrase I, I like is the way we can see the wind by the swaying of the trees and the flapping of the clothes on the line. And that's, you know, I, it, I, I, you, you look at each form. How did this person get to be so greedy? Why is, why is this guy like Donald Trump or, or like Exxon as a corporation? How did it get to be that way? And you can trace, and I, you know, the, it's not like I've, you know, laid it all out, but I've been working for 60, almost 60 years to analyze how did it get to be that way? And then you ask, well, once you look at the, the 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 dense web of cause and effect, and you look at the uh, the connections of causes that produced a Donald Trump, 
or all the other places we see greed at work in our society. And then you say, okay, well, all right, so the fossil fuel industry got to be greedy because of those causes. What are the effects of having that? Well, one of the effects is we can't make, we have been unable to do the things we need to do to preserve the planet by taking responsible action so that our grandchildren aren't living in things like India having 140 degree temperatures in the springtime this year. You know, what's their life gonna be like? That's different patterns of brokenness, different things that are from the cause to the effect, and then from the effect becoming the cause of other things. And you can see a force of brokenness, which I, I think looks a lot like evil, the way it works in the world. Now, um, again, you, you did a very good job at placing the blame of our current, here in America, that is, uh, the ones that are showing the most brokenness, ones that are showing um, a lot of these, these behaviors as Republicans, and I think you use them as the example to do it. But how do we hold the quiet accountable? Let me give an example. Um, you know, the, yeah, we, I, I do believe that the Republican Party has done much evil, as you've stated. But is it not evil as well? for those that, you know, you hear me call these guys neoliberals or otherwise, um, how do they fit the picture if, even if they're not necessarily the protagonists, their actions actually allow this evil that you talk about, this uh, force that creates this evil to continue unabated? Well, there, part of the issue of brokenness is the dynamics of polarization. Now, I don't know how deeply to go into that in this conversation, but- We don't have a lot more time. We have about 20 minutes left, so uh, okay, 15 well, minutes left. Okay, well, I- 15, I, yeah. I think, you know, I've been, since the early 90s, calling out to liberal America that there's a problem arising. Um, I saw it. I myself saw it first in the form of, of Rush Limbaugh's poisoning of people's minds. It wasn't until 2004 that I saw the bigness of it, that that was, that was uh, laying the groundwork. Uh, those poisoned minds became, you know, he accentuated everything that was broken in people's minds to begin with, their prejudices, their resentments, their lack of critical thinking, et cetera. But, there is a polarization process going on. And what I saw, what I've seen, and I, 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 liberal America has been terribly slow to perceive what was going on. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this, you know, progress has been made as, as this thing becomes, you know, like a monstrosity. Uh, I mean, it's just, you look at like Greiton's ad. I mean, how would you parody that? I mean, you know, you couldn't have put that on Saturday Night Live in, in the 80s or, or even the 90s and anybody would think anything like that could ever happen in American politics. So they did, they, people are, but why didn't they see it? Well, I, I think that there are, there are several dimensions of, what happened to liberal America, which are all sort of, they became opposites. What happened on conservative America was a morally bankrupt party that was really good and highly motivated to fight the fight for power. The opposite, out of the dynamics of polarization, liberal America became the opposite. They, proposed basically constructive things, and they didn't have a clue of what the fight was about or how to fight it. How to fight to get it. Yeah, but you, you know, you, you, it's the same battle that uh, FDR and Churchill had to fight, you know, when the fascist powers of other nations threatened decency. But those guys had a, 
did not have the debilitation that grew out of this dynamic of polarization. So liberal America, first of all, they don't take questions of good and evil seriously because of some intellectual, broken intellectual non sequiturs that they absorbed out of, out of early 20th century philosophy. We can talk about that anytime you want, but I don't think you wanna get sidetracked on that right now. That's one thing. Also, even though the, their pe the people on the right are just hungry for fighting, I mean, they love their guns. They love to go out in the street and threaten election workers. They love to, uh, you know, it's just fight, fight, fight. They don't know anything else. There's no appetite for cooperation, even though the country really could use it. Fighting is what they do. We're finishing this interview on a second day because lightning took you out, doctor. <laughs> lightning took the doctor out. Anyhow, we are back. Um, let me go ahead, uh, Dr. Schmuckler, and, and ask the question, the last question again. Um, Polarization is a big thing in this country, I understand that, but I want to, you to answer it within, in, in two contexts, okay? First, the major cause of polarization, but secondly, uh, the complicity that I see, not necessarily you see, but the complicity that I see with neoliberal Democrats as a part of giving too much strength to the other side that makes that polarization even worse. Go ahead, please. Well, I, I once again, I I don't find the uh, um, the neoliberal uh, concept of uh, very relevant to what I think is going on. Okay. Uh, uh, we've we've you and I went there before uh, on that issue, um, but you know on this you know I, I've I've paid attention to a different level of it. I've paid attention to. You know, you've used the word complicity um, uh, just before we went on the air. And, and I, you know, the problem is with the liberals, no, with no with people on the on the liberal democratic side of the divide is not to be understood in terms of complicity. It, I, I think it's been it, it's a matter of um, certain disabilities. Um, that are the byproduct of uh, of the polarization process, or they just you know maybe some of them like uh, um, liberal America was simply quite ill-equipped uh, in a, in a variety of ways that we're we've talked about, quite ill-equipped to go up against a force like the one that's taken over the other side, and 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 a lot of that's got to do with. Uh, a polarization that we were talking about before, you know, my power outage took me out. Uh, and that's got to do with uh, uh, where, where, just where was I at that point? Okay, uh, what, what, what polarization, what, what's the real yeah, force behind so I polarization? Was say, I was saying that, well, basically what, what happened in America in the last 30 years can be described as a systematic division between the forces of righteousness and the forces of power. So that you end up with, uh, with a Republican party, as I was saying yesterday, which because they've pushed each other into being opposites of each other, that's part of what happens. I and mean, we can talk about that dynamic in our relationships and stuff like that. But they push each other out and we get to the point where, and when I was running for Congress uh, here in the, the Shenandoah Valley, uh, a line that- uh, Let me stop you, you right there. You gave one of the most eloquent speeches when you were running in the Shenandoah Valley that I probably should play. Uh, I, I wish, I, I, I don't know, I, I'll go ahead and maybe insert it here, but you had one of the best speeches that really put Republicans in their place then. But go ahead, well, continue, please. That, that speech contains within it the framework of understanding the human story, or at least big pieces of it. But I don't 
come right out and say it. I'm giving a political speech, but I'm analyzing the nature of the force that's taken over the Republican Party. And this was back in 2012. So in, out of that process of polarization, we end up with a Republican Party that, as we were saying yesterday, it's just, it's insatiable in its drive to get more and more power. I mean, they'll give us a president who can be, as they all say, the most powerful man in the world. And what is he doing? He's continually trying to get more. You know, you would think you'd be content to have more power than anybody else. And, and, and you, but not if you're insatiable. And, and so there's a line in that speech about insatiable in its lust for wealth and power. And no. meanwhile, Go ahead, we I'm have sorry. a Democratic Party that in moral terms passes muster as one of the benign forces, especially because it's having to fight something like the Republican Party. So they're always on the side of the good because the Republicans are always at this point on the side of evil. I mean, you, you have to push in the direction you have to push when you're being pushed back into your own end zone as liberals are right now, as we're about to get a theocratic decision on, on the right of abortion from the uh, Republican appointed uh, Supreme Court. A uh, Supreme Court that was appointed by the minority of Americans, which means that the presidents who appointed these, these Supreme Court justices actually never won the popular vote. Five of them, amazingly. Now, I wanna, I wanna uh, contest you on one particular issue because this one irks me. I think you said something very important in your last comment. You said that uh, the, 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 you, you accuse the Republicans of polarization, and you also uh, talk about the Democrats being the benevolent force, which I agree with in general, progressive Democrats, that is. But let me ask you a question. When, uh, when, when, what do you do when we have a one or two Democrats that it turns out what their purpose or what they're doing is really attempting not to do what uh, what is right as you speak it, the benevolency. Let's give a, an actually concrete example. And the concrete example is policies where people are suffering and need some sort of a recompense now. And we couldn't do it. We got a promise from Democrats that we were going to have something like Build Back Better, but somehow we had two that refused to uh, be a part of it, in effect, joining Republicans in the evil that they do. You shouldn't draw any big conclusions from that. The Democrats were handed basically a nearly impossible hand. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, somewhat by, by a, a sequence of what looked at the time like wonderful events, the Democrats won both those seats in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, what everybody had kind of assumed uh, it was going to be a Republican controlled Senate mm -hmm. became a 50 50 Senate with a re Democrat. But anyway, that's not where it's at. They, 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 okay, Manchin, I mean, I'm really interested in understanding Manchin. I'm interested in understanding cinema, but we're just dealing with a, with a, a 50 de, uh, human being democratic caucus. And somehow it does, it works out that we've got two people for reasons of their own act in a way which Amer the historians of this time will say they were the great villains of American history of that period, though there have been plenty of, uh, uh, in this era also. But I mean, it's just terrible. Um, all the good that could have been accomplished. I mean, this was this build back better package. A lot of it was just a matter of uh, uh, of helping America catch up with some other decent societies. And a lot of it was going to save a, uh, a lot of people a lot of money. And a lot of it was favored by large majorities. So it just doesn't they did what they could given that they couldn't get unanimity of people being behind, this is a historic opportunity. It's a, a time of multiple crises. It's more important than usual that the government take constructive action. I mean, when FDR took office in 1933, the country was a wreck. And it was more than usually important that something be, uh, be tried. And Biden's package of, pro, uh, uh, of proposals, I think, if there's any of it that isn't at least defensible, and a lot of it is a slam dunk, including climate change, I don't know. I mean, I couldn't make a case against any particular piece. 
uh, uh, but I, it, maybe some of it's wrongheaded, but most of what I know is this was an excellent job by an administration putting together, but they couldn't get it passed. So my question, yeah, my question to you problem. though then, doctor, my question to you then, that wasn't, you, you, you just said it, right? Most people wanted all those things. It's not the polarization among Americans that's really causing the problem, but among the leaders, right? Okay, well, let me put, bring in the polarization at this point. Yes, sir. The, the, the reason that this is happening right. is that the Democrats, you know, what the Republicans are doing right now is really indefensible. I mean, I would have no difficulty uh, making a case in court that obstructing in this situation, rather than seeking ways of cooperating to do things that are good for the nation, is a completely indefensible course. It is sacrificing the well-being of the people. It is sacrificing the, um, the well the well-being of the country and mm -hmm. and the future of the country in order to grab back power be, by making the failure of the president their their priority, not the success of the country. It is indefensible. Now, if I ran the zoo, if I were had the bully pulpit in front of me they would be denounced for exactly what they are doing. There is no defense for this across the board obstructionism. Obama never prosecuted them for it. During Obama's administration, I wrote this series I called Press the Battle. I mean, why do the Democrats wait for, to, for something outrageous to happen? No, go right after it. There it is, it's threatening American democracy. Press the battle. That's what I would say. And I would press the battle by, by exposing the complete indefensibility of this obstructive tactic by the Russian, by the Republicans, by the Russians, which it shows that all they care about is their power, not the good of the nation. And that should be sufficient for the American people to see they should be driven into oblivion. I agree wholeheartedly. And uh, at, that, at this point, Dr. Schmuckler, uh, given our mutual admiration for that particular subject, I will call it until our next, our next program. Thank you so kindly for the great work that you've done. Thank you for kindly for exposing your ideas. And we'll continue our series because I love your work and I love your thought process. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics and Right. Well, thank you. And, and, and uh, there's a lot in it for me to share the fruits of thinking about this stuff for well we will be time. talking about that sir and that's why you're here you have a wonderful day sir well thank you i'm very grateful for this opportunity we we i hope you guys enjoyed that uh, bridge, MC bridge mcp has that statue of liberty that seems to be walking back to france bridge where did you find that uh yeah i like him he's we're doing a series on humanity so um uh, we have about three or four more to go. Uh, in fact, I interview him immediately after this show for our next one in the series. Uh, I love what uh, Lewis Johnson had to say. People keep saying that the left doesn't see how to fight the battle. I don't know about that. The problem seems to me that they don't know how, effect, how to do effective battle without becoming that which they oppose. There is so much to that statement, uh, Mr. Johnson. Um, I think you hit a particular nail on the head. Carl Cox says only progressives like Warren Sanders and AOC are willing to fight the good fight for the common good. Neoliberals like Pelosi and Schumer aren't willing to fight for the common good because their constituencies rarely include the common good. She's the same one who also said, Oh, we don't need to uh, protect Americans against Congress people trading stocks. Oh, really? Come on now. Uh, I see Daniel Ledo is in a very interesting conversation with Bridge MCP. This guy talks like a radical, not a scientist. He doesn't hide his political ideology. Clearly, it is bleeding into his research, and he puts research in quotation, Daniel. I hope you'll be hanging with us tomorrow, Daniel, at Ask Egberto Anything. Uh, ask Egberto anything tomorrow, folks. Don't forget, it is at 11 Central. Let me give you that link again. Let me give you that link again. 
visit us. Oh, aguanta, por favor. Aguanta, por favor. Visit us at politicsdoneright.com slash ask Egberto. Politicsdoneright.com says ask Egberto. Anyway, it's time to do my ask, and then I'll come right back to you, my brothers and sisters. Politics Done Right depends on you to keep doing what we do. What do we do? We make sure to keep, number one, the internet seeded with blogs and information to counter the right and to present what progressives represent for the benefit of us all to everybody so that it's not misread, misled by any other entity. We make sure and populate that internet with blogs, with videos, with all these other things to make sure that we are informed and to counter everything that you normally hear that, that are lying at the right. We also make sure to create articles in, in magazines, articles in newspapers all around the country to ensure, again, that our message gets out there. Last but not least, we also write books. As you see it, Class Warfare, the only re resort to right-wing doom, How to Make America Utopia, are two of the many books that I've written on these issues. So please support us in one of many ways. Numero uno, you can support us at PayPal, either one time or monthly. Go to politicsdoneright.com slash PayPal. You can support us on Patreon. That is politicsdoneright.com slash Patreon. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You can support us by becoming a part of our YouTube channel, going to politicsdoneright.com slash YouTube, or you can support us in many other forms that you can find at politicsdoneright.com slash support. Be sure to visit our store, politicsdoneright.com slash store, and get our books at politicsdoneright.com slash books. Politics. All right, folks, so please support the show. And by the way, I, I think I told you guys about going to uh, Netroots Nation. So uh, please support our, uh, uh, please support our, what is it called again? Uh, you know what it's called. Let me get that link. Let me get the link. Let me get the link. Here we go. Please support our, our GoFundMe for uh, our trip to Pittsburgh, PA where we are going to meet with all the progressive politicians and activists and everybody else. Thank you for reminding me, Bridge MCP. Thank you for reminding me. Let me show you where we're at with our GoFundMe. There we go. We are getting, we are getting there slowly, slowly, slowly. Love you guys. So please support our, uh, our GoFundMe. There it is on the screen. That is uh, the last time that I did it. The last time I did it was in, nine, in 2019, right before the pandemic. And then the pandemic hit. And for two years, we had to do it over uh, Zoom, but it was nothing like it should have been. Netroots Nation is nothing like being out there with all the politicians. I remember uh, talking to Rashida Talib when I was out there. And um, I got a snub from the governor, Governor Ensley from Washington. I wrote about that. Governor Enzi, I had an interview set up with Governor Enzi, and his handlers really screwed it up. And uh, I really let them have it because, you, you know, you know how it goes. If you say you're going to do something, you do something. Anyhow, so uh, that, that is one of the pictures. And uh, let me, I think I have some other pictures there in the para ver, para ver. Uh, I'm pretty sure, but I'm pretty sure. Where did I get? I know I had more pictures. There. Oh. That is at one of the net routes when I was there with uh, Ace, uh, AOC. This one here is when I with uh, with Tom Hartman and Rashida Talib, and I, I had some others. I I, I just kind of pulled up some some quick ones. I have some with Cory Booker and and the guys, the the couple of mayors and all that stuff. So please go ahead and support Daniel. I give a hundred bucks if Egberto comes and mows my lawn. Um, I, I, you don't have to give me $100 to mow your lawn, Daniel. Let me tell you something, Daniel. I'm going I'm to tell you something. And I honestly mean this. If I thought I could get by, by mowing your lawn, you know, you, you know I, I have no problem showing any, with humility, right? If, if, if I knew you would sit down and while I'm mowing your lawn, you're listening to the words that I'm talking to you, not trying to f for a comeback. I'll come and visit you, brother. 
There's nothing wrong with mowing a lawn. I mowed lawns. I made money mowing lawns. I did all kind of stuff mowing lawns. I washed dishes. I swept floors. I, let me tell you, when I came, I'm going to tell you guys a little story. I think I put this in one of my books. I don't remember if I did or not. But when I came to the United States, I went to Blinn College. Because the only reason I went to Blinn College, Blinn College gave me a music scholarship. Yeah, I played the tuba and the bass guitar. So I was in the jazz band, and I was playing tuba in the marching band. I could not march. They, they kind of asked me not to march, but I was in the band, okay? Now, here's the kicker. That summer, I knew I couldn't get my engineering degree at, it's a junior college, and I wanted, I didn't want to be behind at a junior college. I wanted to be at the main stuff right away. So I got accepted to University of Texas, Austin, and the University of Texas, uh, and uh, Texas A&M University. And of course, I went to College Station, and I went to Austin. I, which, which one do you think won? Austin, U, University of Texas. But to go there, I needed several thousand dollars because I was paying out-of-state tuition. 40 bucks an hour for, for foreigners while it was $4 an hour for in-state. So that summer I worked, I, I washed dishes, swept floors, and cleaned at the community college, Blinn. I also worked at the factory, the uh, cotton mill in Brenham, Texas. The cotton mill was right sort of a, a side of downtown. To, so I worked at the cotton mill, and I also sold fireworks. So this was my schedule. Cotton mill between 11 at night until 7 in the morning. I went to the university from 7 in the morning until noon. And then between noon and like 3 o'clock or so, I went to sleep. And then between 3 and just before 7, I sold fireworks. So I got about 2 or 3 hours of sleep, sold fireworks, and then went right back to the cotton mill. And I worked as much as I could, seven days a week. So I know about working, brother. So I don't know if that's what you were kind of pulling out there. But anyhow, folks, I tell you, um, I am, today, they approved even more money. Just under a billion, if I recall, to send to Ukraine. And I'm for supporting Ukraine. I don't have a problem with that. It's a war, and we don't want the evil Russia to beat up on Ukraine. Not that Ukraine and all those guys are any kinds of saints or anything, but we don't want that. So we, we want to make sure that Ukraine is taken care of. But my questions to all of us, for the number of Americans that are suffering, they're still going through their post-pandemic suffering. How comes we can't get laws passed that supports them. Bridge MCP says, Egberto Willis is witnessing a judicial coup in process. Yes. Uh, <laughs> she's telling me, hey, what about that particular second topic? Let me put that on the screen for you. I think it's actually an important topic. Um, right now, what the Supreme Court is doing, according to AOC and according to the lady who wrote uh, the book, um, uh, uh, I forgot the name of the book. Anyway, uh, I interviewed her, actually. But uh, our judicial system at this point in time is the actual coup. You know, they talk about smoke and mirrors, right? Uh, what is the link for GoFundMe to Netroots? Okay, let me put that link back up for you. Here is the link for the Netroots. There it is. I just put it up there for you. All right. It's in the chat. AOC, uh, let me go to Common Dreams because I think that's where I saw the article, Common Dreams. Let's go to Common Dreams. I wanted to cover that a bit, but I already had it in our blog, so I figured if I didn't get to it that you guys will be able to get to it. So here we go. Um, uh, let's see. Beware, beware. Uh, para ver, para ver. With the death of Progressive have just... I want to find the article. Uh, I look like I may have to just go to my page, politicsdoneright.com. I, w I wanted to get, uh, go to Common Dreams. But here's the deal, folks. We are all concerned. We are all concerned about the coup that, that Donald Trump failed at. But Donald Trump was successful at the real coup. Donald Trump was successful at the real coup. And what was the real coup? 
Let's get to it. Oh, I don't have it there. Madre mía, que lo que pasa. Sorry about that, guys. I thought I had it on my blog because I, I was hurried up to get the blog out. So let me see if I can get it. Naomi Klein says, the U.S. is in the midst of a shock and awe judicial coup. And here's the article at Common Dreams. I'm going to put the link. In, AOC has a similar article out there at Common Dreams as well. And it starts, renowned environmentalist and author Naomi Klein argued Thursday that over the past week, the United States experienced the early stages of a rolling judicial coup. And why does she call it a rolling judicial coup? Because it's, it's rolling. We got rid of women's rights. We got rid of the EPA's ability to really control uh, corporations polluting our environment. We, are, we, we also have Alito who just picked up a, that where they are going to evaluate whether or not, whether or not states are going to have the rights to overturn an election by the people. So, you know, while everybody, or while we talk about Donald Trump being too, too, I don't want to use the negative words, to have had a successful coup, the truth of the matter is that there is, he did effect a coup, but just a cleaner one. And it's called appointing three stolen judges to the Supreme Court who act lockstep and barrel for a rolling coup where they completely disregard whatever laws the majority wants, whatever Congress has passed, they disregard that. And now, whatever they want to do, they do. So let's say Congress says, we are going to increase taxes to, to create a, a, uh, a work ethic, a, a base wage, basic income. Let's say we are going to build that. And to do that, we have to increase taxes. You take it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, sorry, that's unconstitutional. Under what grounds? Who cares? We say so. Because that's what they did with the laws that they've just passed. It's, not, it's about, they don't care. That's what we believe. That's what we will have. It's called minority rule. And that is where we're at right now. My, hey, we just got a contribution from Jim. Jim Kemmelman, thank you so kindly for supporting our, our GoFundMe page. Thank you so kindly for supporting our GoFundMe page. Let me go ahead and throw that link out one more time before we shut this baby down to see if we can get another few GoFundMes. Here we go is the link for supporting our GoFundMe. So anyhow, I'm going to go over by two minutes or so. Here's what I want to say. So um, we have to rethink what we've been saying. we got to rethink what we've been saying. We've been saying, suppose Donald Trump wasn't so dumb. He would have been successful with the coup. Thank you very much, Jill. He would have been successful with the coup. And you know what? You know what? The intellectual holes in Egberto's arguments are embarrassing for him. Okay, Ledo. Enlighten me, please. Educate me, please, Mr. Ledo. You know I love to be educated. So please. Anyhow, folks, please go to our, our, our GoFundMe. It is politicsandright.com slash go or rather politicsandright.com slash netroots. Politicsandright.com slash netroots. And I just put the link back into the uh, feed again. I'm gonna do it one more time. But anyhow, folks, so here is the deal. Donald Trump successfully executed the coup. The problem is that he wanted to stay in power. You see, his handlers, his puppeteers, they wanted the Supreme Court. So they allowed the resident, you know what, to execute. They wanted the puppeteer to give them the court. But he thought they wanted him. Watch what they're going to do to him going forward. He's already produced. Donald Trump has already produced. Let's see 
what they'll do to him now. Let's see who comes to save Donald Trump. Anyhow, folks, I got to get out of here. It's past the two minutes. Carl Cox, the don't wants a banana republic style of government, not democracy. I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm going to be doing a lot of preparation, getting a lot of videos out this weekend. Jill Kinneman says, I love your description of what happened with the courts as the concept of a judicial coup. It's a powerful description. Thank you so kindly, Jill. It is what happened, my dear. It is what happened. Folks, my name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right, and you guys know how I end this baby. I am what? Out! We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We